I first want to announce that I am no more pro-Palestinian than I am anti-Israeli. I am pro-human rights and anti-oppression. If the roles of the two sides were reversed, I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing now, yeah. except that I would be advocating for Israeli rights. But if I were pro-Palestinian, I would be justifying oppression. If enough of us, and this is really critical, if enough of us, especially lawmakers, took the time to educate ourselves, I don't think it would be that hard to find a solution to the Israel-Palestine tragedy. But we cannot trust the mainstream media whose so-called experts have proven themselves expert at repeating Israeli propaganda and ignoring the historical factors that led to Hamas's Al-Aqsa flood on October 7th. Of course, Israeli loyalists do not want to know the history because they see Israel the way they want to see themselves, as fair and humane. Therefore, history that portrays Israel as unfair and inhumane is a mortal threat to their self-imagery or ego identities. They would rather send their children to war than inquire into their imagery and their unexamined beliefs. They would rather be right than make peace. 11 days after Al-Aqsa flood, President Biden flew to Tel Aviv where he hugged Prime Minister Netanyahu, whose lifelong obsession has been to ethnically cleanse the land of Palestinians, and who, during the Obama-Biden administration's first term, tried to sabotage a second term. So what was Biden to do? His certainty that, quote, were there no Israel, America would have to end one, would have to invent one, end quote, his standing as possibly the largest, or at least one of the largest congressional recipients ever of money from the Israel lobby, his lack of knowledge, and his attachment to his self-imagery as both the empathetic president and a proud Zionist made him a sucker for Israeli propaganda. Therefore, Netanyahu didn't really have to do anything to convince him to provide Israel the weaponry to, quote, turn Israel into an island of ruins. And what could Biden say to the traumatized families whose deaths, mutilations, and homelessness his empathy helped to produce? He says he gave Israel the means to defend itself, but he really gave Israel the means to avenge itself. He could have told Netanyahu, we will not allow you to turn Gaza into an island of ruins. 75 years of contempt for international law is enough. It's time to make peace and bring the hostages home. And if Biden was oblivious to the blood-curdling screams of genocide from Israel's political, military, and religious leaders, when it finally dawned on him they meant what they were saying, why didn't he stop arming Israel? Even after Biden admitted that Israel's invasion was, quote, over the top, meaning more genocidal than he thought it would be, even when he uh, admitted that Netanyahu was, quote, an asshole, he continued <laughs> arming Israel. Moreover, despite no evidence to support its allegation, Biden took Israel's word that 12, later reduced to six, then maybe zero UNRWA employees, United Nations Work, Work and Relief Agency employees, participated in the October 7th attack and he cut off funding to the humanitarian organization in Gaza's most desperate hour. So in addition to all of his other poor choices, in his hubris and seduced by his self-imagery, he allowed himself to be suckered into helping Israel starve the Gazan population. Throughout its existence, Israel has been contemptuous of Palestinian life. I'll give you an example. On Saturday, December 27, 2008, Israel bombed the Gaza Strip and started Operation Cast Lead. At the same time, it simultaneously violated its ceasefire that it had with Hamas, and it violated the Jewish Sabbath. Exactly two weeks later, on another Jewish Sabbath, Israeli officials blocked life-saving humanitarian aid from entering Gaza, insisting they could not violate the Sabbath. On March 30th, 2018, Gazans, well, one more thing, during Operation Cast Lead, 
Operation Kislev easily surpassed Al Aqsa blood. Israel killed more than 1,400 people in Gaza, including 344 children. 36 children were killed during Operation Al Aqsa flood, and nobody knows how many were killed by Israeli fire and how many were killed by Hamas's uh, fire. On March 30th, 2018, Gazans of all ages gathered near the fence separating Gaza from Israel for the Great March of Return, where they declared their right to live in dignity and called on Israel to give them the freedom to return to the towns and villages their families were expelled from in 1948 and 1967. Over 100 meters away, on the Israeli side of the fence, safely stationed behind earth mounds and lying in wait were highly skilled Israeli snipers who proceeded to kill 58 Palestinians, all unarmed, including children, and injured 3,000. The next, and, and by the way, the snipers used bullets fabricated to leave survivors maimed for life. And many of the survivors had to have their legs uh, amputated. The snipers were shooting at their legs. Many of them had to have their legs amputated because Israel for years has not allowed mod, much of the modern medical equipment that most hospitals would have to enter Gaza so they didn't have the equipment to avoid amputation. And Israel wouldn't let them go to Egypt, the West Bank, or Israel for leg-saving treatment. Um, so the day after this slaughter of 58 people, the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, tweeted, quote, yesterday we saw 30,000 people. We arrived prepared and with precise reinforcements. Nothing was carried out uncontrolled. Everything was accurate and measured, and we know where every bullet landed, end of quote. A couple days later, the Foreign Affairs Director, Eli Hazan, said that the 30,000 nonviolent demonstrators were, quote, legitimate targets. And Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman explained, quote, you have to understand, there are no innocent people in the Gaza Strip, end of quote. And for Israelis who worried that the scene at the border could get out of control, Shin Beit, the Israeli security agency, Shin Beit Director, you, uh, Avi Dichter had very soothing words, quote, the Israeli army has enough bullets for everyone, end of quote. During the next 12 months, snipers murdered 277 Palestinians, including 52 children, and injured 28,000. By advising Biden to green light Israel's invasion, Secretary of State Blinken put his loyalty to his Jewish heritage ahead of his loyalty to his country. On his first trip to Israel after October 7th, he told his host, I come as a Jew, meaning I'm one of you, I'm part of the tribe. Uh, on at least three occasions, I heard Blinken say that a Palestinian child's life is as valuable as the lives of his own children, but obviously not as valuable as Israel's right to defend itself against children. I wonder what Blinken, how Blinken would feel if his children had to have limbs amputated without anesthesia. With their attacks on Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, their refusal to condemn Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus while condemning Iran's reprisal, Biden and Blinken have signaled their willingness to go to World War III in defense of Israel's final solution to the Palestinian problem. And if those two foot soldiers were tone deaf to Israel's calls for genocide, they still had to know that that was the intention because in addition to Israel's multiple attacks on Gaza since 2008, each time where they deliberately targeted civilians, Israeli prime ministers, chiefs of staff, and others have admitted to that intention. In 1948, with David Ben-Gurion, for those who don't know, Ben-Gurion is the founding father of Israel. In 1948, with Ben-Gurion's approval, Yigal Alon, the most prominent general in the 1948 war, wrote, quote, there is a need now for strong and brutal reaction. If we accuse a family, we need to harm them without mercy, women and children included. Otherwise, this is not an effective <coughs> reaction. During the operation, there is no need to distinguish between the guilty and not guilty, end of quote. The late Zayef Sheff died less than 10 years ago 
who was revered throughout Israel's political and military spectrum as its greatest military analyst, said, quote, the Israeli army has always struck civilian populations, purposely and consciously. The army has never distinguished civilians from military targets, but purposely attacked civilian targets, end of quote. Raphael Eitan, Israel's longest serving chief of staff, said, I don't believe in peace because if they had done to us what we did to them, we would never make peace, end of quote. <laughs> I have a question. Does anybody in this room sleep with their shoes on? <laughs> the reason I ask is when I was in Gaza in November 2012, Israel, random Israeli gunfire killed 13-year-old Hamid Abu Dhaka while he was playing soccer on the dirt road in front of his house in the village of Abbasan Kabira, which is about a mile from the, from the Israel-Gaza border. The next day, my delegation attended the boy's funeral. Afterwards, when we walked back to our bus, a group of villagers was waiting to speak with us. And one middle-aged woman said to me, do you sleep with your shoes on? Knowing that her question was rhetorical, I asked her if she slept with her shoes on. And she told me that Israeli helicopters, drones, and tanks enter Gaza as often as six days a week. And when they do, they fire indiscriminately in all directions to scare away anyone in the area, which is how Hamid got killed. And she told me that these intrusions are so terrifying that many people sleep with their shoes on so they can jump out of bed at a moment's notice and run to safer areas. I mean, imagine living like that yeah. for your entire life. Until, now I wanna, I'm gonna tell you a little about, a bit about how I went from being a member of APAC and a staunch defender of Israeli policy to where I'm at now. Until July 2006, I believed that the cause of the Israel-Palestine problem was the Arab world's non-acceptance of a Jewish state in its midst. And I believe this non-acceptance was a result of hatred of Jewish people, their culture, and religion. On July 12, 2006, Hezbollah killed three Israeli soldiers and abducted two in a cross-border raid into northern Israel. Coming just three weeks after Hamas had captured Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit on the Israel-Gaza border, I saw these provocations as proof that the Arab world would not rest until Israel was wiped from the face of the earth. So the next day, Israel invaded Lebanon, and I supported the invasion, but I was deeply troubled, so I decided, by the way, I saw myself in the place of these innocent soldiers that Hezbollah, these innocent soldiers that Hezbollah had attacked. I regarded myself as much a target for terrorists as Gilad Shalit and the others. So the day after that attack, Israel invaded Lebanon. I supported it, but I still felt troubled about what was happening. Not, not that Israel was invading Lebanon, but I was troubled about the hatred that seemed to be coming towards Jews which is mostly an illusion. So I decided to speak to my two, two of my closest and wisest friends, neither of whom was Jewish. I wanted to convince them that my fears about the Arab world were justified. Both of my friends, I knew that both of my friends had been critical of Israel in the past, but this time I was certain, given the circumstances, that they would agree with me. But to my amazement, they blamed Israel for its disproportionate use of force against the people of Lebanon. Their reactions demoralized me. Neither one of them had much sympathy for what I had to say. Afterwards, when I was alone, I carefully went over each conversation in my mind. I wanted to see if there was something I had missed, something I hadn't understood. Finding nothing, I solemnly concluded, drum roll please, that only Jews can understand the suffering of our people. <laughs> Um, then every, so, so uh, uh, then a week passed during which I calmed down a little bit because I spoke with Jewish friends whose like-minded views softened my anxiety and I attended a pro-Israel rally where there were a bunch of non-Jews which felt kind of good because now that meant that maybe the Jews aren't so isolated and hated in the world by, an, by a bunch of anti-Semites. But then I received an unexpected call from an old Jewish friend back east. Sammy was calling to tell me he was coming out west and planned to visit me in New Mexico, where I was living at the time. After agreeing to the visit, I, I immediately 
launched into at least a two-hour diatribe against Israel's enemies. And Sam just listened, barely saying a word, never arguing. However, unlike me, he had actually studied the issue for many years. <laughs> Toward the end of the diatribe, but he was very low-key about it. Toward the end of the diatribe, he suggested I read books by two very well-respected Israeli professors, of course I'd never heard of, Baruch Kimmerling and Tanya <coughs> Reinhardt. Because Sammy didn't resist my point of view, he gave me the space to begin to question the belief system I had taken for granted my entire life. Until that moment in 2006, believe it or not, and actually it's very common, it had never occurred to me there was more there, there was more to understand than I already more to know than I already knew, or that studying the subject could add to my understanding. So we hung up and I went on Amazon and I looked up books by Kimmerling and Reinhardt. I also compiled a list of other books on the subject with the stipulation that I would read Jewish authors only, knowing that otherwise I would suspect bias. What I could not have foretold was that I was about to uncover a lifetime of bias within myself. So I drove over to my library and checked out a few books from my list. After a week of fairly uninteresting reading, I picked up Beyond Chutzpah, on the misuse of anti-Semitism and the abuse of history by Norman Finkelstein. With barely an idea of what I was getting myself into, I began reading. Thus began a conscientious study of the history of Israel-Palestine. My singular commitment was to the truth, and I knew that in order to separate fact from fiction, I had to give equal attention to both sides of the debate. And I was not about to allow preconceived notions to influence my understanding, my research. Finkelstein's sources were mainly mainstream organizations, such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the Israeli NGO B'Tselem. And their reports were a serious indictment, all of them, a serious indictment of Israeli behavior and policy. Documented charges included the use of deadly force by Israeli soldiers against unarmed men, women, and children, the bulldozing of houses, sometimes with inhabitants still inside. And by the way, since 1948, Israel has bulldozed almost 50,000 Palestinian houses and not a single Jewish house. And when I was in the West Bank in 2010 in the village of Shaknin, I met a Palestinian man and his Norwegian wife, and they lived in a very nice house in Shaknin, but a foot of the land that his father had owned for decades, that his father had bequeathed him and his brothers, they each got a parcel of land, about a foot of his land intruded into a line that was drawn by Israeli demographers, or whatever they're called, uh, that was slated to become an illegal settlement. So Israel demanded that the man, that Israel created a demolition orders for the man's house. The man refused to demolish, what happens is many Palestinians demolish their own houses because Israel charges them to demolish the house for them. So it's cheaper for them and humiliating to demolish their own homes. Well, this man, the, the people of, the, of Saknin, came out and blocked the bulldozers. And so at the time I was there, they had not yet been able to demolish his home. So they get a foot of land, and of course they would take all the land. Okay, so, as I said, Finkelstein's main sources were, were these uh, human, mainstream human rights, rights organizations. In addition to collective, uh, in addition to uh, uh, bulldozing houses with people sometimes still inside. They punished people, large numbers of people, innocent people collectively on the basis of alleged crimes by lone individuals. The theft of desperately needed water from Palestinian villages and Israel's commonplace use of torture. Many of the reports Finkelstein cited could be found online so I spent a great deal of time reviewing passages he had quoted. I was intent on catching him taking information out of context or changing a word here or there in order to present Israel in a negative light. But after hours of, of, of reviewing his, his citations, I had to admit that in every single case his documentation was beyond reproach. At the same time I was engrossed in Finkelstein's expose, I was experiencing a range of emotions. 
As I learned about the abuse and humiliation Israelis routinely subject Palestinians to, I felt shocked that a country in which I had invested a lifetime of loyalty would treat people this way. My shock turned to anger that Israel was perpetrating these abuses in my name as a Jew. I felt personally responsible, no less so than if I was a soldier in the field. In fact, an image of me as a soldier in the field arose to my mind, to my consciousness. My anger then turned inward against me, rebuking me for years of willful blindness. Shame and embarrassment followed, and then immense sorrow for a people whose cries I had been deaf to. These human beings were suffering profoundly from my ignorance. It became clear to me that every Palestinian is inherently guilty of the crime of not being Jewish. I was in the initial stages of learning that every argument I had ever made in defense of Israel was either factually inaccurate or, if there was truth to the argument, taken out of context for the purpose of blaming the Palestinians and exonerating the Jews. Feeling overwhelmed and needing a break from this repudiation of a lifetime of core beliefs, I put the book down and closed my eyes. I have no idea how long my eyes were closed, but when I opened them, I felt cleansed and free. All of the emotions I'd been suffering were gone. Their absence was so startling that I spontaneously began searching for them, as if they were solid objects that could hide in physical locations. I, I scoured my bookcase in the corners of my room. Where's the shock, the anger, the shame? But no sign of these emotions reappeared. So I sat back in my chair and relaxed into my newfound state of freedom and wonderment. I had nothing to do and nowhere to go. I was not interested in the past and I was not drawn towards the future. The present was all there is. I felt a light pressure as if a soft veil were covering my eyes. There was a soothing quality to the pressure. As I enjoyed the sensation, the veil began to unravel in a spiral motion from left to right. And when my eyes were uncovered, the world was brighter. And I realized that the world is a reflection of our internal states of consciousness. The world is an interactive or psychophysical process. A profound, the next thing that happened was a profound, a profound inner peace pervaded my being. It was everything I could have wanted. It was the heart's desire. And as I looked out, I saw that peace must be discovered within before we can dis discover it without. If we want to transform the world, we first have to transform ourselves. Next, I couldn't detect any <coughs> fear of extremists. My enemy images of these people seem to have vanished. But given the terror I felt whenever I heard about atrocities in the Middle East, I decided to test myself to see if these images were really gone. So I imagined myself in the place of Nick Berg, the young Jewish man who was beheaded in Iraq in 2004. Berg's beheading had horrified me, but the enemy images would not return. Instead, a whole body, warm and blissful feeling that I identified as equanimity rose up through my body, along with the knowledge that beneath their hatred, even the most bloodthirsty of extremists crave the same right to self-determination as do I. With this knowledge, the humanity, their humanity that I had unconsciously de denied and my humanity that I had unconsciously squandered were restored. To finally see all people as human beings is the greatest relief. I can't tell you what a great relief it was to find out what a schmuck I had been. <laughs> Once the beliefs that blinded me were gone, I felt like I had awakened from a dream and was no longer burdened with the emotional pain I had taken for reality. Within the dream, the pain had lasted for a lifetime, but in this newly awakened state, it was merely a faint memory. Sensing something was missing, I then tried to inquire into my Jewish identity, but I could find neither a Jewish identity nor any other limited identity. An image of a balloon materialized, its elastic boundaries representing the limits on understanding imposed by a limited identity. The balloon burst, and the air inside the balloon equalized with the air outside the balloon, and truth was revealed. We are all Palestinians and Israelis, Muslims, Christians, 
and Jews. Existential fear and confusion, the hallmarks of separateness, were transformed into compassion and clarity. Existential fear is the prism through which the separate self views the world. Therefore, along with existential fear, confusion arises. Compassion is the ability to stand in the shoes of the other and see from all perspectives. Therefore, along with compassion, clarity arises. Compassion and clarity, seeking to understand all behavior, ask why the other behaves as he does. What are the stimuli for his behavior? Have we in some way provoked his behavior? Compassion and clarity understand that no behavior occurs in a vacuum and that each of us is responsible for the suffering in the world and each of us contributes to the collective mind of humankind. One reason, a very important reason, that Israel-Palestine has been so difficult to solve is that fundamentally we are not dealing with a political, territorial, religious, cultural, or ideological problem. We are dealing with a psycho-spiritual problem, a problem of the psyche or mind and of identity. It was not until I understood this problem that I was able to apprehend the astonishing reality that I had never cared about Israel, nor had I ever defended Israel from criticism, at least the Israel that actually exists. What I had defended and what I had cared about and protected, just like Israel's loyalists, including Biden and Blinken, were idealistic images of Israel that I had superimposed or projected onto the Israel that actually exists. Those projections enabled me to deny painful imagery about myself and Israel that I would have noticed if only I had looked without the influence of a mind that only saw what it wanted to see and only believed what it wanted to believe. The mind is the separate self, the identity, the ego. So here are two universal principles that are at the root of conflict and suffering. And these two principles, and you, you may have to spend, if someone really wanted to understand them, I suggest spending a lot of time with it. These two principles encapsulate this understanding that I've been describing. The real enemy is not someone or something outside of us. The real enemy is the unexamined mind that unconsciously projects its suffering onto the other and then blames and scapegoats the other for its suffering. The second, the root of conflict and suffering is the attachment to a presumed, limited, and mortal, I emphasize mortal, identity, and to the beliefs and images that emanate from and reinforce that presumption. The reason I, I emphasize mortal is because people see criticism, if they are identified with Israel, they see criticism of Israel as a mortal threat to their self-imagery. If they are not who they say, that who they think they are, how they define themselves, they are terrified. That is why I said earlier they would rather send their children to war. I think I said that. They'd rather send their children to war than inquire into their beliefs and images. Thus, the real conflict, taking this into account, is not Israel versus the Palestinian people or Israel versus a hostile world. The real conflict is the failure to integrate the hard to believe but unmistakable reality of Israel's treatment of, no of Palestinians with unquestioned loyalty to the Jewish state. One consideration recognizes Israel's dark side. The other denies the dark side exists. I want to move on to Hamas, and I'm not a fan of Hamas. I'm not a fan of any fundamentalist organization, and I'm not, I'm not a fan of any organization that often treats its people brutally. But since 1988, Hamas had, has made well, more, well over a dozen attempts to make peace with Israel, all totally ignored. In 2008, Yuval Diskin, the head of Shin Bet, the Israeli security agency, confirmed that Hamas was willing to accept a long-term ceasefire on the 1967 borders. And by long-term, he was talking 40, 50 years. That same year, the Strategic Studies Institute of the US Army War College wrote that Hamas had, quote, accepted the notion of a limited area for a Palestinian state and would recognize Israel in a de facto manner. End of quote. Israel has never recognized the Palestinian people or their right to a state. 
On June 3rd, 2009, Hamas sent President Obama a letter outlining its commitment to pursue without preconditions a just resolution within the guidelines set by the International Court of Justice, the United Nations, and human rights organizations. <coughs> that same year, in 2009, Jimmy Carter wrote that Hamas, quote, would accept any agreement if it submitted to a referendum in the West Bank and Gaza and the Palestinian people approve it. That means they would accept Israel's right to exist if that's in the agreement. Israel's never accepted the Palestinian right to exist. In fact, it doesn't want them to exist at all. Former National uh, Security Advisor and former head of Mossad, Ephraim Halevi, said the U.S. and Israel could strengthen Hamas's moderate wing and engage them in a peace process. They didn't. Halevi also said, quote, if Israel's goal were to remove the threat of rockets from the residents of southern Israel, opening the border crossings would have ensured such quiet for a generation, end of quote. Israel's government refused to open the crossing. Obviously, they're not so interested in peace for a generation, in quiet for a generation. They have other goals in mind. Speaking of rockets, in the nine years ending on December 31st, 2008, during Operation Cast Lead, Gazan groups fired a total in that nine year period of 8,088 rockets into Israel. That's, that's on the basis of a right wing Israeli think tank. Now compare those, those figures, 8,088, to the nine month period, one twelfth the length of time, nine months, not nine years, to the nine month period ending in June 2006, during which Israel fired 7,700 far more deadly rockets into Gaza. I wanna mention something, when I was in Sterot in 2010, Sterot is one of the uh, towns that was attacked on October 7th, it's like a mile from the Gaza border. I saw lots of uh, rockets that had been shot from, from Gaza. I saw lots of depressions in the ground where they landed. I would estimate that if I were 10 feet away from a rocket landing, I wouldn't have been hurt or maybe injured a little by flying debris. Israel's rockets have a kill radius of up to 150 meters. That's almost 500 feet versus 10 feet, okay? So there's a huge difference between the rockets Israel launches against Gaza and the rockets that Hamas launches against Israel. Um, a few months ago, the House of Representatives passed Resolution 894, which equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Historically, some of the staunchest Zionists were anti-Semites who wanted to rid their country of Jews. And, some of the and many of the staunchest anti-Zionists were religious Jews who considered a nationalist movement to create a Jewish nation heresy to the Torah, which says that only God through the Moshiach, or Messiah, can establish a Jewish state. Pro-Israelis who equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism presume that you're not an anti-Semite if you deny documented history, but you are one if you accept documented history. You're not an anti-Semite if you defend Israel's contempt for international law, but you are one if you believe in international law. And you're not an anti-Semite if you rationalize Israel's cruelty towards the Palestinian people, but you are one if you have compassion for the Palestinian people, in which case all Palestinians are anti-Semites. Doesn't this narcissistic reasoning characterize the Jewish people as inhumane? But such a characterization would itself be considered anti-Semitic. In other words, the proof you're not an anti-Semite proves that you are an anti-Semite. This is the dualistic mind infected with existential fear and confusion. I wanna briefly, very briefly, and my books cover, the, cover a lot of the stuff in here, I want to briefly mention two of the most common arguments Israeli loyalists make to justify Israel's position and stance against the Palestinians. The first is the 1947 UN Partition Plan, which took, unilaterally took, 56% of Palestine from the Palestinian people and gave it to Israel, gave 43% with only 20% of the coastline to the Palestinian people, and the remaining 1%, Jerusalem, 
and Bethlehem was placed in a corpus separatum to be administered by the United Nations. The argument that Jewish, that Israeli loyalists make is that Jewish acceptance and Palestinian rejection of partition proves the Jewish side has always wanted peace and the Palestinian side has never wanted peace. Therefore, the Palestinians are to blame for this problem. It's their fault they live under occupation. This ridiculous argument imagines that Israel would have been content with 56% of Palestine and no Jerusalem when Israel has never been content with the 78% of Palestine it has controlled since 1949. Moreover, a Jewish state under partition would have had a 49% plus Palestinian minority that would quickly have become a majority. It is utterly naive to think that Israel would have accepted such an outcome. And in fact, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding father, pledged to his political party that the borders established by partition were not permanent. And he said, after we become a strong force, as the result of the creation of a state, we shall abolish partition and expand into the whole of Palestine, end of quote. It wasn't just Ben-Gurion. Chaim Weizmann, who was Israel's first president, who was the man mostly responsible for the Balfour Declaration in 1917, that, that in which Israel announced that uh, the Jews could have a homeland. Chaim Weizmann said before the partition plan was passed, and this was going on for more than a decade, where the, where the Jewish agency in Palestine was lobbying for a partition plan and for a state of Israel. Chaim Weizmann said, the Jews would be fools would be fools not to take a piece of land the size of a tablecloth. Why? Because they knew they were going to expand into the whole of Palestine. In March 1948, taking all this into account, in March 1948, two months before Israel became a state, the U.S. State Department warned, and I quote, this is very interesting. I wish more people would read this, especially people who defend Israel. The Jews will be the actual aggressors against the Arabs. However, the Jews will claim that they are merely defending themselves. In the event of such Arab outside aid, the Jews will come running to the Security Council with the claim that their state is the object of armed aggression and will use every means to obscure the fact that it is their own armed aggression against the Arabs inside, which is the cause of Arab counterattack." End of quote. The second argument I very briefly am going to go over is Palestinian rejection of Israel's alleged generous offer at the 2000 Camp David Peace Summit. Well, if Israel's offer was so generous, why did Israel's chief negotiator, Shlomo Ben Ami, say, quote, the concessions offered by Israel fell far short of even modest Palestinian explanations? And he also said, if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well, end of quote. Moreover, if Israel was really interested in peace, why has it totally ignored the Arab Peace Initiative, which was first introduced in 1988, has been on the table in, since 2002, was reiterated in 2012, and Israel has never had a word to say about it? That peace initiative guarantees security, provides security guarantees for all the states in the region. It would end the Arab-Israeli conflict and it would normalize relations between Israel and every Muslim country on earth, all 50 of them. So why is it that in the name of peace, so many people rationalize Israel's refusal to make peace? Why in the name of justice do so many people rationalize Israel's unjust policies? Why do they protect Israel from accountability for its crimes and give it the means to perpetrate those crimes? Are they evil? or are they terrified of the truth? As I said earlier, these same people would rather send their children to war than inquire into their beliefs and images. But it's not because they are evil. It's because in their existential fear of inquiring into their personal identities, into their presumed identities, they are confused and they suffer deeply, even though they are unconscious to their own suffering. This is why I say that the real enemy is the unexamined mind that projects its suffering onto the other and then blames and scapegoats the other for its suffering. Years ago, an old man in Gaza stood on a corner holding a placard, 
I always cry when I read this, on which were written these words. You take my water, burn my olive trees, destroy my house, take my job, steal my land, imprison my father, kill my mother, bombard my country, starve us all, humiliate us all, but I am to blame. I shot a rocket back, end of quote. I want to end with a short quiz for you all. I'm going to read a quote that includes the word Yid. For those who don't know, the word Yid is a derogatory name for a Jew, okay? And you're going to guess who said this quote. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. The person I'm quoting was male and lived and died in the first half of the 20th century and was extremely well known to the worldwide Jewish community. Here's the quote. Yid is anti-Zionist. We have known him for a long time. And just merely to look at him, let alone approach or heaven forbid, touch him, was enough to make us feel sick. The Yid is a hideous distortion of the human character, something unspeakably low and repulsive. The Yid is the curse of the Jews. Watch out, Yid. End of quote. Any guesses? Excellent guess, you're wrong. <laughs> Any other guesses? I can't hear you. No, but I'll give you another hint. This person who made this quote, his birthday is celebrated as a national holiday in Israel. Any other guesses? Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism. He was an atheist who detested religious Jews. He did not circumcise his son. He even went to the Pope and said, if you help me get a piece of land for the Jewish people, I'll convert them to Roman Catholicism. Okay. Can you read that quote again? Now yeah. I know who said it. Okay. And what did you say was Yid? Yid is a derogatory word for a Jew. Okay. I, I want to tell you a little story. This is, has nothing to do with Israel Palestine. But a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine who I grew up with all my life, be, was, was cat, born up Catholic. And he went to medical school and eventually became the assistant coroner in Philadelphia and then became the head, the chief forensic pathologist for NATO. And while he was over in Germany, where he was stationed, uh, he started developing paranoid uh, delusions. And he, was and he started thinking the Nazis and the Russians were coming after him. And he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic in his late 30s. And so he was given a medical discharge. And um, one <laughs> and so I, I, Kenny's friends, Kenny was his name, uh, my, my twin brother and I were very close friends of Kenny, and he liked a couple of the other Jewish kids in our neighborhood. And he sort of identified as Jewish, at least after he became a paranoid schizophrenic. And he had, he had on his walls, as you would walk up his stairs, on one side of the wall he had photographs of American generals, George Patton, Omar Bradley, Dwight Eisenhower, etc. On the other side he had photographs of uh, Orthodox Hasidic rabbis, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Satmar Rebbe, the Bobov Rebbe. And um, anyway, so uh, one time I, I called Kenny up and I said, I was visiting back east, this is in New Jersey. And no, I, what happened was I ran into my uncle. My uncle lived two doors from Kenny, all Kenny's life. And Kenny's family was sort of friendly with my uncle's family and they knew him. And my uncle used to play tennis with me and Kenny. And Kenny was a te tennis star in college. So my uncle told me, I ran into my uncle, and he said, you know, I was at the motor vehicle division, and I ran into Kenny. I said, oh, and, he go, and I said, what did, he, what did he have to say? And he said, well, he told me he was, gonna get, he was getting custom-made license plates, and the license plate said YID24. And then my uncle goes, what is he doing? What is he doing? And so I called Kenny up. I said, Kenny, you can't put YID24 on those license plates. YID is a derogatory term for Jew, but YID is also just the, the, the Yiddish word for Jew. So Kenny just didn't know any better. Anyway, that has nothing to do with Israel Palestine, but I thought I'd mention it. Okay, I'm going to read the quote again, okay? Yid is anti-Zionist. We have known him for a long time, and just merely to look at him, let alone approach or heaven forbid, touch him, was enough to make us feel sick. The Yid is a hideous distortion of the human character something unspeakably low and repulsive. The Yid is the curse of the Jews. Watch out, Yid. And they celebrate his, holiday, his birthday every day. 
Most of the Zionists were not religious. Now there are religious Zionists like Be Bezalel Smotrich, for example, who's the uh, in, in one of the coalition members to Netanyahu. He's he's a religious Zionist, and I think Ben Gavir, who's in charge of security, he may be religious Zionist, or maybe he calls himself just a formal Zionist. But he's really they're both religious. Okay, that ends the talk. Does anybody have any questions? Um. First, to thank you. Um, I really, I deeply appreciate the description of your spiritual awakening. It sounds a whole lot like nonviolent communication. Can you and speak Buddhism, up? Can louder. you speak up or use the mic? Is there a mic? Yeah. <laughs> I just have a loud voice. Anyway, it was an expression of appreciation. <laughs> and uh, what I want to ask, because I that's been my take on this situation is what you described as a psycho-spiritual issue, it is exactly that. This is a spiritual transformation that needs to happen, and we keep approaching it as if it were a political Correct. problem. And of course, it is that too. Right. But underneath it, yes. um, and some of it is rooted in the Bible. Those stories are horrific. Anyway, and can be used in a lot of different ways. But what I want to ask you, because I didn't hear anything, was what would you propose to do as a first step toward transforming this situation? And one thing I just want to mention while I'm speaking is just in case you, I, I'm sure you're aware of the combatants for peace. Yes. I hope you are. Okay. And yes, I've met them. Okay, so that's one thing I do and I did a long time ago, as soon as they were formed, I joined them and support them because they're veterans, you know, Israeli and Palestinian veterans who say, this is crazy, and what we need to do is get to know each other and so forth, which I know is part of what you suggest. What else? <laughs> okay, first of all, as I mentioned and strongly implied, we're not going to reach the people who are strongly identified with Israel. We need to speak to people on the fence, okay? People on the fence, when they hear a logical, intelligent, sane, humane argument, they're going to see what's real, okay? But the people who are like I was at one time, forget it. You're not going to reach them. To give you an example, my relative, I'm still in touch with many people I grew up, many Jewish people I grew up with, who I went to even nursery school with. None of them, well, there's, there's two, but it wasn't because of me, they just happened to be open-minded, but most, almost all of them, they will not pick up a book. They will not even read my book, and they think they know more than I know, even though they know they've never studied the issue, and I have. And they know that I'm smarter than them, and always was. <laughs> they know it. Okay, so I can't even reach them. Okay, so my, first of all, lobbies. We gotta get rid of these, these lobbies, the, the, the billions of dollars that goes into perverting the, the system, the political system in the United States is obscene. The fact that APAC is not even listed as an agent of a foreign country is also obscene. But the, in my opinion, any dark money should be eliminated, which means reverse Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that the Republicans here, here. supported. Uh, we've got to get rid of these lobbies and purify the political system. As I mentioned, if this were 1938 Germany and there was an AGPAC, American German Public Affairs Committee, our, most of our congressmen in Biden and Blinken would be supporting Adolf Hitler. I don't see that much difference between Netanyahu and Hitler, honestly. So they both want to ethnically cleanse. And really, when I say ethnically cleanse, for most people in Israel who, who support what Israel is doing, which is over, which is something like 98% supported Israel's invasion of Gaza, 68% right now do not want Israel allowing humanitarian aid in the country. They want to starve these people to death, right? Almost 60% think Israel has been too easy, has been going too easy on the Palestinians since they attacked, okay? So I forgot what I was going to say, uh, but um, uh, when, this is what happens. People on the fence. That's who you want to talk to. Okay, so people on the, okay, so <laughs> education is very important, but again, we see in this country how the Republicans in the Red states are trying to prevent, really, you know, they don't, you can't even 
You can't even read Huckleberry Finn in, in school. You can't read To Kill a Mockingbird. They're really trying to maintain the myths, the myth of the lost cause, for example, in the South. They don't want their children growing up thinking that Southerners, Southern whites, uh, supported slavery and that the Civil War was a battle to end slavery. They want people to think that the Civil War, that the South's participation in the Civil War was a noble battle for states' rights. Okay, so they're training, just like they do in Israel, they are training their children to, to not be in touch with their humanity and to separate the world into us against them. That is what they do in Israel. And they do it so severely, I have seen numerous videos online of Israeli soldiers, young Israeli soldiers, mostly in their 20s, bragging, I killed 22 children and I'm gonna kill more. And then, and then the, the reporter was saying, you're a monster. And he, it didn't phase him at all. He was so happy that he had killed all these cockroaches because Israel has trained its people to think of the Palestinians as subhuman. The language its leaders have used, uh, like I, I mentioned, uh, well, I mentioned Raphael Tan, Eitan, Israel's chief of, longest serving chief of staff, who said, if I were, if I were, a, Palestin if I were a Palestinian, I would never make peace because of, no, if the Palestinians had done to us what we did to them, we would never make peace. Okay, so I mentioned him because he used to refer to Palestinians as cockroaches, okay? And other, other people, other prominent Israelis, generals and politicians have called them beasts walking on two legs, human animals, uh, crocodiles, all kinds of horrible things. They really dehumanize them. Anyway, so we've got to start with education. Now, I'm not particularly confident that anything that that, uh, that this is not that this is ever going to get any better, I see Israel maybe moving towards using a nuclear weapon against Iran in the future. Okay, and I see this world becoming so polarized that uh, I that we're going to destroy ourselves. Maybe maybe we're going to destroy ourselves just through the environment. But all I can say is I don't do this because I think I'm going to have success. Uh, promoting the cause I support. I do it because it's the right thing to do. And maybe at some, in some dimension, in some time, what I do, what all of us do, will somehow reverberate throughout history and have some kind of effect in the future. So, we'll see. Thorin. Even if we take out the red state folks like DeSantis who are trying to purify the university system there, we have the elite universities, Ivy League and elsewhere, where right after um, October 8th, the, um, or October 7th, the uh, billionaires that were funding their uh, schools were pulling their money out, and then Congress eventually called in the presidents of the universities. And now we have a situation where Columbia, Harvard, University of Southern California are taking the lead in silencing all protests. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not just that it's not an educationally conducive environment, it's that the ability to protest and free inquiry in universities is being taken away by people who are supposedly, you know, a higher level than just a red state governor, you know, kind of a higher thinking level, and yet they're crushing independent thinking in the universities. How do we move past that? You know, the fun, uh, that's, that's a hard question to answer because a lot of the funding comes from the money that, that donors bequeath. And a lot of the donors are Jewish. And I have always said that when someone's identity, Jewish or not, but when someone's mortal identity is threatened, there is nothing they will not do to defend themselves, to shut you up, if, even just the words. When I criticize Israel and I make an argument against Israel to my friends or my relatives, which I don't do anymore, it's, it's a waste of time. But if I do that, they feel so threatened. Now they don't, they're not that conscious of how they feel deep within, but they are so threatened because when I criticize Israel, as I say, their presumed identity is fused with Israel. Israel as the, as the safe haven for the Jewish people, as the innocent nation that represents Jews is part of their identity. So when I challenge them, it's as if their self, as if they are facing a mortal threat. They're, they're about to die because their belief is part of how they define themselves. If that belief is wrong, that is a form of death. And again, that is why so many people, not just 
not just with the Israel-Palestine issue, with all kinds of issues. So many people would rather send their children to war, to kill or be killed, than inquire into their presumed identities or into the beliefs and images that constitute their presumed identities. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that this is a spiritual, this is a spiritual um, issue. I call it a psycho-spiritual problem. <clears throat> I was, um, when you were mentioning, when you're talking to your relatives and such, and you're trying to convince them and argue or make points, I was curious in discovering, do you, do you listen to them for, in other words, listen to their views? Absolutely. In other words, don't express your view. Right. Don't put your view in there, make your points and look for things to say, but listen and empathize and, and no. come, oh, well, <laughs> well <laughs> tell you then, you, then you are not communicating with them. That's right. Then I'll you have that. a wall. Oh, that's true. And well, let that me mention wall, something. That, that's the spiritual context. That's right. Where However, you're not communicating with them. And, and in the listening, when you hear their, their communication, you, and you hear their fears relating to those emotions, relating to what is motivating them to feel that way, or to be that way and communicating on that context, as opposed to the ideology or the facts, but the, what their fears are and their, them individually, why they believe. Well, I know what the fears are because I used to have those things, but let me just mention, yeah. it is very difficult, especially with family, especially, oh, of course. With, especially with my I'm identical, it's easy. especially with my identical twin brother, who is an, who's an Orthodox Jew, okay? There is no way of getting through to him. There is no way. In my first book, by the way, one of the, I, I hope my brother doesn't see this. In my Don't first give book, up on talking to them, but you need to start listening. Let me finish. Let me finish. You need to listen. In my first book, there is a chapter on my dialogue with my twin brother, okay? okay? Now look, some people, you just can't read. When my nephew calls me up, he goes, he calls me up, he says, hi, Richie, how you doing? Let's not talk about Israel-Palestine. <laughs> and so I don't. I honor his wishes. I, I, I'd rather have peace in the family. It's a very difficult thing. Oh, I know. I know. And, and someone, here mentioned non someone here mentioned nonviolent communication. Let me just say that even people, I once attended a 10 day retreat with Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, who died, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. He was no, no, wonderful. Just a couple. What's that? Just a couple of years. No, it was more than that. It was probably, okay. anyway. So Marshall, okay. Marshall was there with his top trainers, the ones who had started with him from the very beginning. They had arguments, and they couldn't solve their own arguments. They, they, one, of them, one of his oldest trainers was arguing with one of his other oldest trainers, and at a certain point she goes, oh, fuck it, and she walked out. <laughs> now, Marshall, and I'm telling you. The whole ego thing. Of course. Because we don't get what we want. So the we ego away, is persistent. The ego lives to preserve itself, aggrandize right. itself, and validate itself. Right. There is no way that you can come from the ego and really solve anything. But you have to, it's, it's such a spiritual practice to surrender the ego. And sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. If you're really triggered, as Marshall would say, you need to give yourself a lot of self-empathy before you can <laughs> speak to the other person. I want to give someone else a chance yeah, to sure. ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's go way back. Uh, ten uh, thousand or whatever BC, uh, Jews have been treated badly, and I'm wondering where does this psychology come from, well, and or why? What started it? Well, the fact that Jews have been treated badly is is a part of the reason why the Jews felt they needed a state of their own. I understand. But I have to clarify something. As I mentioned about Herzl being totally anti-religious, Zionism was a movement that very few Jews subscribed to, okay, very few. And in fact, there would not even be an Israel if not for the fact that the Zionist organization blocked FDR's plan in 1944 to take in, between the United States and Western Europe, 100% of Holocaust survivors, okay? The Zionist organization blocked it. And there was a poll taken at Dachau, a Dachau concentration camp after the war ended. Only 15% of the Dachau survivors said they wanted to go to Palestine. And I'm sure that about half would have returned. Okay, There was um, 
there were more in the 1920s more Jews emigrated from Palestine than emigrated into Palestine. So Zionism <clears throat> needed a uh, real uh, deceit in order to uh, create enough of a demographic of Jews in Palestine to create a state. And that's what they did. They blocked FDR's plan. So yes, it's part of the Jewish psyche, you could say, people who are brought up with these stories that the, uh, that the Arabs have always hated Jews. It's part of their psyche about the Amal having to destroy the Amalekites and the, and, and the Jews had to fight all these different tribes. It's in the, you know, in the Old Testament. But that's no excuse for not examining your own thoughts. It's no excuse for recognize that before you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, you are a human being, and you share a common humanity but with everybody. But can, can you explain the pogroms, the things The pogroms? That, yes. Well, I mean, Christianity, okay, starting in the fourth century at, at the Council of Nicaea, Christianity decided that the Jews had killed Christ. Okay. Okay, so that became like a meme for a lot of people, that the Jews were Christ killers. And that influenced people's attitudes towards Jews. It made the Jews more insular also. Right. More, moreover, one third of the Jews in the world, for the most part, lived in Russia. Okay, and they were not allowed to be professors, lawyers, doctors. So what did they do? A lot of them ended up being moneylenders. Right. Yeah, but why were they not allowed? They were not allowed because they were Christ killers. Okay. Okay. During Passover, look. One of the I don't I don't know how many how many people here have heard of the blood libel. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, okay. The blood libel was a Christian tale that during Passover, Jews would would kidnap and kill a, pal, a, a Christian child and use the child's blood to make matzah, unleavened bread, bread, which is what you eat during Passover. Because that's one of the nasty memes. And I do want to mention that in the Arab world, they didn't have uh, anti-Semitic uh, memes or themes, okay? It wasn't until, uh, you know, until the uh, Zionists started taking over Palestine, that they borrowed the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, which was introduced by the Russian Secret Service. It was actually, uh, and Henry Ford made the protocols of the elders of Zion, very popular. I think it talked about the Jews trying to create a worldwide conspiracy through the financial system. It was originally a satire on Napoleon III, and the Russian Secret Service got a hold of it, and they changed it enough to, to change uh, change the, uh, the, the the information, the alleged information about Napoleon to Jews, and then Henry Ford, who was a staunch anti-Semite, he disseminated it, and so th it, it's there's so many stories throughout the world. I remember growing up, and people always saying that Jews are cheap. So these Christian kids, they would borrow money from me, and they wouldn't pay me back because I was cheap. <laughs> they wouldn't pay me back my money that I was generous enough to loan them, but I was the one who was cheap. I mean, and then in the South, it was very common to hear people say, what are you trying to do, Jew me down? A friend of mine who worked in Denver, a Jewish friend, who worked at uh, a, a um, Rosen Ford. I don't know if Rosen Ford is still there. It used to be on Colfax in Colorado or somewhere near there. Harvey worked at Rosen Ford, and he often would have people come from rural areas of Colorado, and they'd want to trade in their truck. Rosen Ford specialized in Ford trucks. And one day, and, and they didn't know, these people didn't know Harvey was Jewish. And one day, uh, one of the people there who, who, who was wanted to trade in his truck for a new truck, he was negotiating with Harvey. And then he goes to Harvey, what are you, what are you trying to do, Jew me down? And Harvey goes, no, I'm trying to Presbyterian you down. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and I, I got to tell you one more story. Harvey, uh, I went to school with Harvey in New York City. And as a job, Harvey worked part time at a sort of a nightclub restaurant. And he was a waiter. And one day he was in, in Greenwich Village, and one day he was waiting on this guy, and the guy was a little drunk. And the guy, and the guy could tell Harvey was college age, and he goes to Harvey, hey, uh, you go to college? And Harvey goes, yeah, I go to college. And he goes, where are you going? And Harvey goes, I go to NYU. And he goes, NYU? And Harvey goes, yeah, I go to NYU. And the guy goes, well, what are you studying at NYU? And Harvey goes, Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, okay, so uh, yes, I'm a clinical psychologist, recently retired. What you have 
admirably described is reenactment of unresolved <coughs> trauma. Trauma not healed from automatically leads to reenactment of trauma, reversing roles. If you're a victim, you're going to reenact the trauma and be a persecutor. Right. Unconsciously, the brain is 90 plus percent unconsciously. Unconscious. You talked, of, you alluded to a psycho spiritual problem. One solution I'd like to offer send mental health professionals into areas that need trauma healing. Right. All the rationality will be on the top. The emotional brain, which lives in fear, right. will always win over the cognitive rational brain. Right. Believe me, because of the need to survive. What, what is your name? Oh, what's your name? Judith Chambers. Judith. Yes. Okay. And to add to what you said, uh, in my second book, the smaller one, in the in the preface, I mentioned studies done by I think University of Michigan and University and Stanford maybe, but there's been thousands that show that when you take people who have firm beliefs and you show them irrefutable evidence that their beliefs are wrong, they become even more staunch in their beliefs. <laughs> Seriously. Now, I also want to mention, because this ties into that, a lot of people say, well, the Jews, the Israelis, they were so traumatized by the Holocaust. And I disagree. Yes, the Holocaust was a defining event among the Jewish population. However, they are trauma the, the people of Israel, most of whom hate the Palestinians, they traumatize themselves. They are not traumatized by the Holocaust. They start at starting in kindergarten, Jewish children are taught that the world hates Jews, that the Palestinians are and the Arabs don't like Jews. They one woman who's an activist in the United States now, but grew up in Israel, told me that in in elementary school classrooms in Israel, they'll have pictures of like the Amalekites and the uh, Philistines and on and on and on to the Nazis and then the Palestinians. And who are our enemies now, children? So they teach kids from early childhood that the Palestinians are subhuman and want to destroy the Jews. So they are tra the Jewish people of Israel are traumatizing themselves. And I cannot think of anything more abusive than raising your child to lose his or her humanity. Okay, so thank you, Judith. Please, May I say solution? one other thing, yeah. please? Okay, please? Trauma doesn't have to happen to you as an individual because you inherit it <coughs> right. through DNA. And feeling, and through uh, like an osmosis-like product, through, like I, my family never talked about Zionism or the, the history of the Jewish suffering. We read about it in Sunday school as, as Jewish kids, but a lot of what I picked up and all my friends picked up, it was through feeling. It was like an os a process of osmosis. And also because we noticed that in some ways we were a little different than the Christians. None of the Jewish kids I talked, with, I, I grew up with used the N-word for black people. I grew up in an area that had a lot of black people. I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. <clears throat> Only my Christian friends used the N-word or, or the spick for Puerto Ricans, stuff like that. So it seemed like maybe Jews were a little more tolerant to me when I was growing up. Okay, so everybody develops their own collective consciousness. And my, my, the, my internal logic, the way I, and the stories I ended up telling me about Jewish trauma and Jewish reaction to anti-Semitism and the birth of, of Israel and the need for a Jewish state were identical to the same stories other people tell themselves. And most of us never heard it from anywhere except within our own minds. Yes, young lady. Oh, thank you for that. You're very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to hear you um, uh, speak on the role of Christian Zionist um, and their impact on our um, national support. Well, Netanyahu a few years ago, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he was basically 
putting his attention on the Christian Zionist community. They were much more valuable to Israel than the Jewish community because the majority of Jews under 40 uh, do not support Israel. They support the Palestinian cause. So he was kind of, kind of dismissing the younger Jewish generations. Um, you know, that, there's that belief that uh, in order, I don't know how much you know about Christian Zionism, but John Hagee and many of the other evangelical dispensationalists believe that, that the uh, second coming will occur after the Jews take over all of Palestine. So they're not even interested in the humanity of people. They're, they don't, they, in a way, it's all, the movement itself, I'm not going to speak about individuals within the movement, but the movement itself could care less about the suffering of Palestinians. Their concern is facilitating the second coming. In fact, I don't know if you've read this lately, but there have been articles in the paper in the last few weeks about a red heifer. A red heifer is one of the symbols or signs that the second coming is approaching. And for some reason, there's been articles in this. But what is interesting is that a number of years ago, John Hagee, who probably is the most prominent Christian evangelical preacher in the United States, he claims he has 50 million followers. I think that's an exaggeration. But he is a dear friend to Israel. Ariel Settlement, one of the largest settlements, named their convention center after John Hagee because John Hagee raises millions of dollars for Israel. His organization is Christians United for Israel. And one of his speakers is a Jewish man by the name of Dennis Prager, who, who's a schmuck. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Hagee, Hagee, anyway, Hagee bought a ranch in Texas a number of years ago for the express purpose of trying to breed a red heifer. And he came close, but there was like a white dot. On the, on the head. He actually thought that he could play God and create this red heifer. But that is one of the signs. My point is anyway that Christian Zionism is a really powerful force because it's a political force in this country and it has huge influence because it's probably the most cohesive uh, demographic in the United States when it comes to voting. I'll bet you more, a higher percentage of Christian Zionists vote than any other demographic in this country. So that's what I can say about that. I do talk about John Hagee and his belief that Hitler was uh, sent by God to shepherd the Jewish people to, the, to, to Palestine. It's in my second book. And um, yeah, so it's just another ideology that is, yeah. in my opinion, yeah. uh, very divisive so and believes in an us against them philosophy. Those of us who are not Christian Zionists um, I'm from Bennett Hill Monastery. We need to get in the, the Thank you. public discourse. Thank you. I agree with you. Yes. The spiritual communities in the United States, in my opinion, must get involved. They are not, for the most part. And the people who are sort of the main figures, you know, the organizations and the prominent individuals, none of them, in my opinion, are interested in a psycho-spiritual point of view, which I think has been a very... Uh, has really caused damage to the movement. It's kept it from really growing like it should have. So we need to encourage more people who have explored the unconscious, who have explored uh, the spirit, you know, who are interested in the spiritual dimension of existence to get involved. Yes, ma'am. If the original prejudice against Jews started with Christians, well, it, isn't this a, an important thing for Christian organizations? Yeah. And I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Church in town, and we just read a prologue by Rachel Maddow, and all of this history about pro-Hitler that was going on in this country, all of that history, and so in the book group, I finally said, can anybody tell me where this started, the prejudice against Jews? And nobody really ever mentioned the Antichrist. I have heard it long ago. Well, can I, let me just mention, one thing we got to understand is that when an individual is born, at a certain point, they develop a, not a philosophy, but an understanding of self and, and other, okay? They define the self in the beginning. They may define the self as this physical body and its relationships and everything that fits within the boundaries it defines as, it, as itself. Everything outside the boundaries is a potential threat. So self and other can often, in its pathological condition, you become 
us against them. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the root, okay? So then people, uh, you know, find ideologies that kind of justify what they're already believing or feeling or that put what they're feeling into words, okay? But it's not like someone is innocent and finds an ideology and suddenly believes the, let's say someone is innocent and they suddenly come across a Nazi ideology, a white supremacist Nazi ideology. I don't think they would suddenly become a white supremacist, right? But if they had certain qualities within themselves, grievances, resentments towards certain people, then when they come across an ideology that kind of justifies, rationalizes, or, or treats their resentments as valid, mm -hmm. then they tend to start embracing that ideology. And then maybe, and in many cases, that ideology will grow within them and they may go to the, really go to the dark side. Well, you just said that churches are not taking sides or much discussing Palestine, Israel. No, I was talking about spiritual groups. Uh, a lot, I'm sure there's a lot of churches that are fairly neutral. I'm sure there's many churches that are very pro-Israel and there's certain churches that are... Uh, but I'm just saying informationally, I don't hear anybody okay. going back historically and I think that's important. I agree with you. The, the, the trauma I agree. down in DNA. So if people can understand that there, are, there is a historical precedent that we in this country are responsible for. Everybody's responsible for the suffering of the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, but, but, said, everybody but it takes information for the mind to change, in my opinion. Right. Well, you know, you can only do what you can do. You know, you talk to people, maybe you'll influence them, maybe you won't. Some people are not interested at all. What are you going to do? This is the nature of humanity right now. We are not, we are living in, as the Hindus say, in the Kali Yuga, the dark times. Okay? And human consciousness is not all that developed. Do right you now. think your book would change people? Uh, some people have told me that my book has changed them. Okay, so that's something I can do. I can recommend it. Yeah, please recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I, no, we can do. no, I think my book is very valuable. I really do. I don't care about the money. I, don't, I hardly make anything on that. But, uh, but, but yes, I think my book has some wisdom in it that is, un that, that is unique in the Israel-Palestine arena. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that does comport with some of the great spiritual teachings like Buddhism. Do you mention the Antichrist? In that book, yes. Okay. Okay. I, get on my email list and then will. You'll, you will email me if you have questions. I will. Uh, let, let, let's hear from the young lady over there. She hasn't sure. had a chance. Me? Oh, I just wanted to say, how do we pay you for your book? Oh, uh, you can pay by Zelle, Venmo, or check, okay. or cash. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, sir. Someone just brought something, something to my attention. Louder, my, louder. Uh, someone just brought something to my attention, and I was just curious if maybe you can, regardless of the dysfunctionality and the polarization and all that, all the effects of the world and the the uh, escapism that's going on. What do what solutions do you see as possibilities? What would you like to see as a solution? Well, well, what I'd like to see is a. So regardless of all that, regardless of what's in it. for everybody, but as right. far as the tools we could use, I would like to see all schools teach nonviolent communication. I would like to see all schools also teach the work of Byron Katie. It's called The Work. It teaches you about how you're projecting onto the world and that the projection, that, you know, that if I call you, you know, um, a liar, it may not be true. I may be describing myself, but imputing it to you because I can't face it within myself. Byron Katie's work is very valuable uh, in that end. I would like to see people start. I, I think that we are in such dark times that it's important that everybody get involved in some kind of authentic spiritual work. Meditation, uh, as I said, Byron Katie's work, NVC. NVC is actually a very profound spiritual practice, nonviolent communication. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, there's many more. And people need to at least have an interest in recognizing that they are so much more than who they think they are. They're not just this limited self with these views, and they have to believe what the Bible tells them because that's the way they were raised. No, they have got to expand their consciousness. But it, ha it can only start one person at a time. Uh, anybody else going once? 
going twice. And thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.